it's shifted away from lunch and I'm this because of you and your naps? Or no, no, no. It was it was a, the students were here before we had to kick them out. Uh, I see. Anyway, we're pleased to have Michael Atia from Edinburgh who will talk. I thought he was talking about a problem in elementary Euclidean geometry, but as I saw the title has changed and it's now an element, a problem in elementary geometry. <clears throat> well, the, the director told me that the purpose of these lectures <coughs> is to be intelligible to a wide audience. Oh, yes, sorry. Now you can hear me. Uh, the purpose of these lectures is to be intelligible to a wide audience. And um, if you're going to do that, there are one, two approaches. One is you can give a big overview. You know, if some of you came to Brian Greene's talk about the universe, that's big stuff. And you can do something similar in mathematics. I think I did something similar here for the opening of this center a year ago. The other extreme is you go down to the microscopic level and go to a small problem, which is so simple to understand. And I'm doing the second today. And it's important in mathematics to remember that mathematics does have these two parts. It has problems that can be simple to solve, pose, hard to solve, they're similar to our thought. Then out of these grow big theories which you, you know, elaborate and so on. So we have the balanced view. So this is really about a very elementary problem and designed to be understood by any student being to high school, even up to the age of maybe 15, something like that. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, much a, pro a problem I like personally, and it's still unsolved. Uh, I've talked about it at different times, but as long as it's unsolved, you can go on talking about it. I mean, Fermat could have gone talking about his problem for nearly 300 years. Um, so, I'm going to, what I'm going to do with a bit of modern technology is I'm going to formulate the problem, um, and it's about n distinct points in three-dimensional space. You couldn't get more elementary than that. The only point is they're distinct points. And there will be conjecture, a very precise conjecture, uh, which is true for all, well, conjecture is for all integers n, and it is known and trivial for n equal to 2. You can prove n equal to 3. With a lot more hard work, you can prove n equal to 4. It's unsolved for n greater than equal to 5. On the other hand, by computer calculations, there's pretty strong evidence that it's true for as far as you can do the calculations, certainly up to about 30 points. So there's some evidence. Now, this problem is so simple, uh, in elementary, it could have been formulated and understood certainly 200 years ago, certainly by Gauss, and even before that. So it's very surprising that this problem has didn't emerge before, unless somebody comes along and tells me that in the library they found an old manuscript. I'll be very pleased. Um, so the question is, what is the future of this problem? Now, there are three possibilities I can think of. First, a counterexample might be found for some large integer n. Well, it's always true. Every conjecture could be solved by finding a counterexample. Uh, that's the negative point of view. Secondly, it could be solved, perhaps by somebody here, uh, proof of the conjecture. Third, it could remain unsolved, like Fermat's theorem, for 300 years. I, I don't know which of these to expect. It's a problem in geometry. It should be easier than number theory. But uh, ease is difficult to define. Now, here is the, the one piece of geometry you need to understand for this is the relationship between real numbers and complex numbers. So you need to know what complex numbers are. That's why I didn't go back to you know, prehistoric times. Um, so the important thing to understand is that the two-dimensional sphere in three-dimensional space, we ca can, of course, write down its equation of some of the squares of the three coordinates equal to some fixed radius squared. That sphere is essentially the same as the complex perspective line uh, using complex numbers, which can be thought of as the complex plane with a point at infinity added. And the way you identify them is that uh, a complex perspective line is really the ratio of two complex numbers, not both zero. You take a pair of complex numbers, identify with another pair if they differ by a non-zero complex constant. That's the formal definition of the complex perspective line. And uh, you can think, if you take the ratio u1 over u2, that's one complex number, which works everywhere except when you go to infinity, in which case you should reverse the order. Uh, and, and the, now, the, the way you relate these geometrically is by stereographic projection. If you take the uh, sphere in, in R3, you pick a point called the North Pole, and you project onto the plane. 
If you get a, a, a picture on the plane, here's a little section of it, North Pole, point B projects onto point Q, and uh, that way every point on the sphere is represented on the plane except for the North Pole itself, which has disappeared off to infinity. The only important you need to know is that if you take a different point as the North Pole, another point, and project onto another plane, then the two different planes, each of which has a complex coordinate, they're related by a transformation, and the transformation is just what's called a fractional linear transformation. The new prime is AU plus B over CU plus D, where AB, CD are complex numbers, so that the determinant AD minus BC is not zero. That's the one piece of, uh, well, a very important elementary bit of geometry you need to know, and that, if you haven't come across it before, as an exercise for you. And with that out of the way, we can formulate, start thinking about the conjecture. First of all, let's start with two points. If you've got two points in R3, then you can think of the, cent the midpoint of them as a center by translating it around, fix, it, fix the center, if you like. Then all you're left with is two points. They're ordered in a certain direction. Take the unit vector that points from x1 to x2. I've written it down as a formula. You divide by the length. You get the unit vector. You get a point on the sphere. So the configurations of pairs of points in the plane which are ordered up to translation by the origin and up to rescaling is just a sphere. Um, and the, the notice that, the, um, that when you interchange the order of the two points, you simply get an antipodal map on the sphere. Now, the question is, what happens if you have n points? n distinct ordered points in R3. Well, you can, of course, take all pairs i and j, and write down the unit vector that points from i to j. In this way, you'll get a bar large bunch of numbers, or points on the sphere, which essentially are parameterized by i and j. Think of it as a matrix. So you've got a lot of points. Now, what, what can you do with those points? What question can you ask? Well, the way I approach this is the following. Consider i fixed and vary j. So as you fix i and vary j, you get the points u, i, j for j varying. Think of those as the roots of a polynomial of degree n minus 1. We call that pi of u. Um, now, small point, if one of your points happens to be, I've used here sort of ordinary complex numbers, infinity should be included. And if one of the points you roots is infinity, the convention is that the degree of the polynomial drops by 1. If you don't like that, use a pair of homogeneous coordinates, and then there's no problem. So here we are, conjecture, first conjecture. There are going to be a number of conjectures. I'll explain why. But the first conjecture, which is the basic one, is simply says that for every, all sets of points in R3, only condition is that no two are equal. Then these polynomials, P1, P2, up to Pn, are linearly independent over the complex numbers. Now think about that for a moment. We've got n polynomials, of degree n minus 1, so they are coefficients will give you n by n matrix. Polynomial is only determined up to a factor by its roots, but the factors won't affect the question of linear independence. And the important thing is that this is linear independence over the complex numbers. You start with real points, real points in three space. And those are nothing to do with complex numbers. But you associate to those real points in three space n polynomials with complex coefficients. Now it makes sense to ask whether they are independent over the complex numbers. So that's the transition from real to complex on which this rests. It's fundamental. Now, it's e easy to see that this... Michael, yeah? What do you get if all the points are on a straight line? I like to have the smart guys in the front, front row. <laughs> just, just wait a minute. All right. um, so first of all, if you project from a different point, another, I'm here, I've chosen one point at infinity. If you change to another point, then, of course, I just told you that you have to make a fractional linear transformation so that it does not affect the linear independence question. So this linear independence is intrinsic to the set of points. It doesn't depend on any preferred direction of projection. It's a geometrical prompt question. Now, uh, let's test the guide conjecture. Collinear points. Now, obviously, the points are not, diff not no equal points. You might think, OK, in general, they will be independent. But surely, there'll be special places where they become linearly dependent. And what's the most special case, as Dennis quickly observed, is when they're collinear. So, so things might go disastrously wrong. But think about it. Put the point on a line. We can choose a line anyway, or coordinates any way we like. So let's choose a line to be the line going from 0 to infinity on the sphere. 
if you like, um, and then label the points 1, 2, 3, up to n. And now look at the roots of the first polynomial P1. They, they, they point from 1 to 2, 1 to 3, they all point the same way. So they give you the same point, namely the root infinity. So the polynomial P1 has all its roots infinite. So it is formally the polynomial 1. Now I go to the polynomial point 2. Uh, the second line has a, has, a, has a misprint in it, like that. And if I press a button here, well, there's this button, I think it is. Uh, this one should be a 2. Nobody has just invented the thing which, when you point it, erases it. There's something there, a big mark is, I think, for a young enterprising young guy who work out how to make this kill that 1 and make it a 2. But if you can do that mentally, the polynomial P2, uh, you see the roots all point to the right, to infinity, except one root points backwards. So this one has one, poly one root equal to 0, and all the others are infinity. So is the polynomial u in the variable. As you go down, you obviously see you get 1 u u squared up to u to the n minus 1. And they are a basis of the polynomials, so they are trivially independent. So the case when the points are collinear is the easy one. Okay? Not only the easy one, you think it's the worst case, so surely if, if it's that easy for the worst case, it should be even easier for the other case. And that's, where you, that's, well, that's your challenge. So the conjecture is that they're always going to be independent, all and we see that it's trivially true when the points are on a line. Now let's take the next example. First non-trivial case, two points are always on a line. Three points are in general, first of all, they lie on a plane. So you actually can cut down the problem from three dimensions to two. And by choosing that plane to cut the sphere in an equator, and choosing the, north, the point of projection, the north pole, you could put all these roots on the unit circle, or if you choose to cho choose the point of projection on the real axis, you can make all the uh, roots real. So you can think of this as dealing with either a polynomial whose roots are real, or roots are on the unit circle. It simplifies the statement in general. The conjecture is still the same. So over the reals, there are real polynomials real with, I mean, if you took the real case, all the coefficients would be really real, linear independence would be questioned over the real numbers, and the conjecture is still true, still valid. Still, still a conjecture. Well, there are two ways you can actually prove it for n equal to 3. You can please know you can prove it for n equal to 3. Uh, first, there's a geometrical proof, which I like. Um, a quadratic, you've got to show three quadratics of in independent. Now, a quadratic has three coefficients, which you can think of as coordinates, let's say, the predictive plane, up to a factor. So if you have three co quadratics, you have three lines in the plane. Being linearly dependent, would mean that those lines all concurrent go through a point. So you've got to prove these lines don't all go through a point. They're not concurrent. If you draw the picture, it looks obvious. With a bit of skill, you could take that obvious picture and make a proof out of it. Alternatively, you can be purely algebraic. You just go ahead, and with a bit of brute force, you work out some determinant and uh, simplify it and get a, show that it can't be zero. If you do it elegantly, you'll get a nice answer. I'll show you the answer later. So there are pro easy proofs for n equal to 3. But n equals 4, well, first of all, n equals 4, the points don't just really lie in a plane. So you really have to worry with complex numbers. You can't get away with real numbers. Um, and for n equals 4, this has been proved by computer algebra. You do it by root force, that is to say, you take a computer and tell it to write a formula down, a polynomial for the determinant. You find 10 to the fourth terms in your polynomial, just out of four points. And the computer, with a, lot of, with a bit of skill thrown in as well, using symmetry, people have managed to prove that the answer is true. But that's for four points, and nobody has the courage to go beyond four. 10 to the fourth would go rather fast. So it's not a problem that is, lends itself to brute force algebra. I like that. I don't like brute force. And for n greater than equal to 5, no proof is known. Even for, co for coplanar points, take n points in the plane. So really, you can think of them as a polynomial with real roots. There's still no, no proof for n, any, um, well, for n equals 4, there's a proof by computers. There's no elegant proof, and there's no proof beyond that at all. So now this is where I offer a bottle of champagne for a solution. And I've checked with the director that most of you are probably over 21, so you're allowed to, I can allow to offer you a drink if you solve it. There's a bottle of champagne waiting in my fridge for the first person to produce a proof. 
but I have to say that bottle has been sitting in the, in the fridge for 10 years and it hasn't been solved yet, claimed yet. And you can start off as a practice run just taking four points in the plane. Nobody knows the proof for four points in the plane, which is at all uh, simple, elegant, intelligible, and so on. One of the problems with this uh, question is that you see, the, you start off with po n points. Um, and then you can manufacture all these pairs of points, depending on u, r, j. And those are the points on the sphere, which are made in the roots of a polynomial. And the question is about the determinant of some matrix. Uh, the point is that the numbers of points in the sphere goes up like n squared, because you're taking two points out of n. Uh, whereas the number of points you start with is linear in n. So that uh, the points in the sphere are highly constrained. It's not true in general that those polynomials will be independent. But all we're asking is that those polynomials that come from points in space are independent. So that n equals 3 is an exception, because both sets have just 3 degrees of freedom. So then there's a unique set of variables, unique formula. In higher up, uh, the difficulty of writing down a formula is that you're dealing with um, too many variables, and so which have satisfy a lot of constraints in the background. OK, well, now we take a break. While you think about the problem, I'll give you 30 seconds. Uh, anybody solves this problem, please put up your hand. But while we're, th while we're thinking about it, um, what do mathematicians do when they can't solve a problem? Well, the best thing you can do with a problem when you can't solve it is generalize. Make a more difficult problem. And this is not entirely escapism. Because quite often, if you generalize it, you put it in a broader context, get new ideas, perhaps a solution. So the idea is generalize if you can't solve it one way. That gives you a better problem, a bigger problem. Perhaps the problem you see when you generalize is actually more natural than the first one, until you get the problem that looks in the right shape to solve. So general, going by generalization is not just this escape from the difficulty. It's actually a way, hopefully, to point to a solution. Now, let's take the following generalization. I'm taking n points in the plane, or three space, sorry. And I might as well, why not I put them all inside a ball? Take a ball of large radius r, fix the radius, only look at sets of points that lie inside that ball, strictly inside. Now, obviously, you can join two points, just see where they meet the, the boundary sphere. And you can call that the point uij, and so on. So you make exactly the same construction before. Bunch of points, bunch of polynomials, same conjecture. So you make a conjecture exactly the same as before. I call that conjecture 1R, but it depends on the radius R that you've taken. And the conjecture is if every R, any set of points, these polynomials are linearly independent. It's not the same conjecture, it's a different conjecture. But it, now, in some sense, conjecture 1R leads to conjecture 1 when you make R go to infinity. It doesn't follow that you've got a proof for 1R that the proof will be in the, valid in the limit. Because, for example, you might be calculating a lot of determinants, all of which are non-zero, and the limit, it might be zero. If you've got a stronger proof, which works better, then the conjecture one may follow from the other ones. Now, again, you can do numerical calculation. I have to say that Paul Sutcliffe, whom I'll give you in the references later, was very helpful with me on this. Every time I had a stupid conjecture, he'd come back, said, I've checked it on the computer, it works on the first 50 numbers, carry on. So, the numerical evidence was this one is, was fine too. Uh, again, the proof when the points are on a line is exactly the same as before. And for three points, the geometrical proof also works as before. The algebraic proof is more difficult, the formula more complicated. I don't think it's been done that way. But it's a nice problem. Conjecture 1R is a uh, natural first step in generalization. Now let's think about that conjecture in a different way. This didn't give me a chance to introduce hyperbolic geometry. When I told the director of my title, I said a problem in Euclidean geometry. And actually, just as well left out the word, because it, the first thing I want to do is to generalize it, hyperbolic geometry. Now, in hyperbolic geometry, which is a geometry uh, discovered by Bolyai, Lobachevsky, and Gauss in the <coughs> early 1800s, uh, says that you, besides the flat plane of Euclidean space, flat space, there are curved spaces, which satisfy most of the same axioms. They have constant curvature, but the hyperbolic space has constant negative curvature. And one model of hyperbolic space, three space, is precisely to take the points inside a ball. The straight lines 
on the same straight lines as in Euclidean space. They are the geodesics. But the distance function is different. The distance uh, defined in hyperbolic space is such that any point on the boundary is infinitely far away. So there's some, I won't write the formula down, they're nice, but uh, all you need to know is that the lines are the same and the boundary of the sphere is at infinity. I know, but I mean, who knows who Klein was? Uh, I'm talking to students who haven't been well educated. Um, maybe in Sony Brook they have been. And, uh, anyway, um, the, uh, now the point is that the group of isometries, the motions of, Euclidean, of hyperbolic space that preserve the distance, preserve the metric, is well known to be the group of two by two matrices over the complex numbers uh, of determinant one and even modulo it said projective. And that is precisely the group that acts on the sphere, the two sphere, preserving its complex structure. The complex structure, because the sphere is, after all, the complex projective line, this is the complex projective group. And so, and it, it's known that the way that the, this group acts on the interior is such that its action extends to the action on the boundary, not preserving any metric but preserving the complex structure, or the conformal structure. Now, the point is that the, um, the way we use the boundary was to write complex coordinates. And that's precisely what's preserved by the group SL2C. And so, uh, this is actually, this version is a better conjecture than the Euclidean version. In the Euclidean version, the only action on the sphere at infinity is rotation, it's a rigid sphere. Whereas, we are using the complex numbers, and the, the rigid sphere is really too restrictive. Another question. So, in your definition, uij yeah. does not uh, is invariant under scaling all yeah. the axes under a positive number. Right. So, given any configuration, you can always fit it inside a ball of any radius. Yes. So what, how, how does that simplify the problem? Well, the point. You, you, well, let, let me put it this way. I'll explain in a moment. The, the, although the problem in Euclidean space is scale invariant. The problem in hyperbolic space is not scale invariant. Um, when you take the points in Euclidean space, you can put them inside a ball, but then the function we define in the ball is not the same as the function defined at infinity. Where the line meets the ball, where a given line meets the ball, is different from the parallel line through the origin. So there are different problems, and they are not the same. But this is the hyperbolic analog of the Euclidean problem. Now, obviously, as the radius goes to infinity, then the hyperbolic space curvature goes to zero. Hyperbolic space converges to Euclidean space, and the, this conjecture, if hyperbolic space, gives us the Euclidean conjecture in the limit. So it is a natural generalization from Euclidean space to hyperbolic space, but what I like about it is that in hyperbolic space, the group acting on the sphere is precisely the group that preserves the data we need for the problem. We, use, we need the complex numbers to write down complex independence, and this is the largest group that does that. The orthogonal group is, is unnecessarily rigid, and therefore, in some sense, artificial. So I claim this problem is more natural in hyperbolic space. So this conjecture is, in, is invariant under the, I mean, you take a configuration of points in, in space, you want to make a conjecture about it, you don't want it to change when you apply isometries. So this is a conjecture about points in hyperbolic space that is invariant under the natural symmetries of that space. It's a geometrical problem. Doesn't depend on any choice of coordinates or anything like that. So I like the conjecture. It's better. We've made progress. We've got a more general conjecture. You might clarify the, the, to point out that in the hyperbolic thing, when you when you interchange the points, if you, if you switch two points, yeah. it doesn't go to the antipode. The That's right. Uh, well, the antipode doesn't make sense in hyperbolic space. The antipode is a Euclidean notion. Uh, any two points by conformal transformation can be put in, let me make multiple points. Uh, that'll turn up. These points are all relevant to the details of the calculation. Can you say why the, uh, you got the Euclidean as a consequence of the hyperbolic? Well, the, 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 um, when, you, when you make the ball a larger and larger radius, then you're making the curvature of hyperbolic space smaller and smaller. Yeah. And in the limit, the Euclidean points in Euclid hyperbolic space become points in Euclidean space. So the conjecture, the limiting conjecture is the conjecture in Euclidean space. I didn't say anything about proofs. Ah. Conjecture is the, the limiting conjecture is the is the is the limit to the other conjectures, okay. and so far as you can make a limit to a conjecture. So it's not a stronger conjecture. There will be one coming up. There's a very smart guy in the front row here. 
<laughs> so, oh, let me see, I think that's just the next point, very precisely. Uh, now, natural the question when you try to write down linear independence of a bunch of vectors is you, you like to define a determinant. Then that gives you a quantification. If you want to prove that something is independent, you want to prove the determinant is not zero. But if you actually work out the determinant, you get a quantity, which is to be proved bigger than zero. So the question is, can you normalize the determinants? Now, it's quite, actually quite easy to normalize the determinants in the Euclidean case, because you've got the space of polynomials. They live inside a vector space, which is, in fact, the space of polynomials. That is an invariant vector under, as a representation of the orthogonal group. You can choose that metric, and you can write down volumes and so on, and you can get a definition of the, the determinant that is invariant under the orthogonal group. And when I first came across this problem, I thought, well, I can't see how to do that in, in the hyperbolic case. But that's wrong. You can define a normalized determinant in the hyperbolic case, too. It's a bit more subtle, but it's perfectly OK. You can define it. Well, anybody who wants to know the details, I can let you know later. So you can define. The point is, let me give it in a sophisticated way. The, 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 the polynomials form a space of dimension n. They are an irreducible representation of SL2C. There is no invariant metric, because the group is not compact. But there is an invariant volume, because it's SL2. And that goes into, goes into SLN. And so there is an invariant complex volume, which is how you define determinants. So then that's the way you can actually define a normalized determinant, quite concretely. Now, when you've done that, we have a function. What do we have? We have a complex-valued function of n points. Points are initially ordered, but if it, one of the properties it has, it's independent of the order. <clears throat> when you permute the points, you may permute the polynomials, you get some sign, but the signs cancel, and you end up. So here's this function. Now, this is a function. I, if somebody wants to name it after me, I'll be very happy. It's, it's a nice function. Nobody I know in, in history of mathematics has previously discovered this function. So, this function, what properties does it have? Well, I told you. It's invariant under the isometries of hyperbolic space. It's mm -hmm. defined for n distinct points. And the limit, as r, when hyperbolic space goes to Euclidean space, this limit exists and is the determinant for the Euclidean one. And that one is now invariant under the group of Euclidean motions, translations, and rotations. So there is a well defined function in Euclidean space, but there is a better well defined function in hyperbolic space, which converges to that. And in all, all cases, this determinant takes the value 1 for collinear points. Now, under reflection, not, not it's a reflection is an isometry, but it's not a continuous one. It changes the orientation. Under reflection, this determinant goes into its complex conjugate. Very nice property for a complex function to have. Um, it's not too difficult from the definitions, but it's, it's a nice property. And so in particular, if the points um, are in a plane, either in the hyperbolic case or in the Euclidean case, then they are invariant under reflection in that plane, so the determinant is real. So this function is real when the points are in a plane, but in general, it's a complex valued function. And in fact, for n points where n is at least 4, you can show that the complex phase is not 0. Now, here's my promised formula. For three points, here and for r infinity, the Euclidean case only, here is the formula. This, this limit, the, the, the term, normalized determinant for three points in Euclidean space is one half the sum of the squares, the cosines of half the angles. A, B, C are the angles of the triangle formed by the three points. Now, this function is patently not zero, it's positive. And in fact, easily to see, it takes the value one when the points are collinear. And other than that, it like, go, only goes from one to nine eighths. It's limited, it actually has quite a limited range. 9 eighths occurs for an equilateral triangle. This, so this function has a minimum at 1 and the maximum for the equilateral triangle. Very nice, simple function. Uh, unfortunately, we don't, there is no corresponding function for, the other, for four points or more, because to start with, there are so many angles, you, know, we, no, you don't have a nice set of three variables to write it in terms of. Anyway, there's the nice formula. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, this is a over 2. A is one of the angles. A over 2, B over 2, and C over 2. Because I'm squared. Of the, so you see it's a triangle, ABC. I call the angles ABC. Some of the squares are the cosines of half the angles. 
And you easily see that if they're online, then the angles are zero or pi, which is, and one of these terms drops out, the other two are uh, one, and it adds up to one. And if the angles are all 60 degrees, then you can check out and you'll get 9 eighths. <coughs> uh, the corresponding formula in the hyperbolic case, I don't think is even known. Um, it certainly involves more complicated functions involving the hyperbolic distance function, but um, uh, we don't, I don't have, nobody's written it down explicitly. Now, as has been pointed out by one of you, the, the, this d infinity is scaling invariant. Including one is obviously scaling invariant because it just depends on the directions from either j and uh, they remain the same. But when points are in hyperbolic space, that's not, not true, but something else is true. Then here is the same in Euclidean space. This determinant applied to lambda times the x is, is the same with a, whatever lambda is. In hyperbolic space, what is obviously true is you rescale the points by lambda. Oh, I haven't got it written down here, sorry. Uh, and simultaneously rescale r, it doesn't change. But that, that's not what I've written here, it's something else. What I've written here is in, se a separate one. It relates to these. This is a function of n points. For each n, there is a function. But those functions are not arbitrarily in separate functions. They're really linked. And how are they linked? Well, if you take one of the points, xn, say, and make it go to the boundary, so that it has the radius r, it disappears into the boundary to infinity, you're left at n minus 1 points. And the property is that the determinant of n points converges to the determinant of n minus 1 remaining points when you've forgotten or pushed this one to infinity. Uh, this is sometimes what you might call a cluster decomposition. If it, you did more generally, broke this set up into two sets, x's and y's, and you separated them out by infinite distance, then the determinant of the whole thing would tend to converge to the product of the determinants of the two clusters separately. So this is a very nice property which relates the determinant function for different values of this number n. Otherwise, you'd have, you know, they, they, they all form part of a systematic um, collection of functions. Uh, more conjectures. Again, I can't prove that conjecture, so we have to generalize more. Um, well, well, or let's, let's, first of all, yeah, we've got to jazz it up. Well, now we have a determinant, we can try to be more precise. The first conjecture was just that the determinant isn't zero. So linear independence just says that. Now you have genuine functions. Second conjecture is more precise. This determinant is actually greater than or equal to 1 in absolute value with equality only if they're collinear. So we know the collinear case, they're 1. This says, if they, in general, they're better than that. They, they get, they, it improves as they go further away. It's a very nice function. It just, well, something to this conjecture, of course. Now there's again numerical evidence for this, strong numerical evidence for this. And now this is the one I mentioned before. If you take at points x1 to xn and rescale them by lambda lambda, the determinant in the hyperbolic case doesn't change so long as you simultaneously change r to lambda r. Now, obviously, if r is actually formally infinity, that's the Euclidean invariance. Well, this conjecture, this is an obvious statement. Now, notice that um, conjecture 2, well, obviously, this one implies conjecture 1. Sorry, this conjecture implies this conjecture is, first of all, independent of r. Because, because of this property here, if you replace r by lambda r, uh, if this one is true for all x's, then this is one's true for all y's, because y is just lambda x. So the condition connection is independent of r when r is finite. And because you have a strict, in, you have integration equal to 1 here, you can pass the limit, and you'll get the same thing for the limit. So this conjecture is stable under the passing of the limit, because we have a strong, if this just is greater than 0, you couldn't have done that. For any number one, you, you're bound away from zero, so you can pass the limit. So this conjecture is, 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 this strengthens the relationship between the conjectures. Now, conjecture three is, is, is rather more interesting. So this, consider this for a fixed set of points, x1 to xn, inside a ball of radius r, expand the ball. So think of this as a function of r for fixed x's. Then this conjecture says this increases with r. It's monotonic. In other words, the Euclidean case is bigger than the, the Euclidean volume is bigger than the hyperbolic ones. It comes at the end of the period of expansion. Uh, now, uh, well, again, numerical evidence confirms this. So, if you believe in numerical evidence, you, that's a good conjecture. 
Now notice that this conjecture, surprisingly, this conjecture 3 implies conjecture 2. Now why is that? Why does conjecture 3 imply conjecture 2? Well, see, suppose you start with n points, and now you take one of these points, sorry, start, let's start with n points inside a ball of radius r and shrink the ball. At some point, it'll hit a point. When it hits the point, call that point xn, um, then we're in a situation where one point has gone to infinity, so the determinant of the n points has converged to the determinant of the n minus 1 points. Uh, now, we can assume by induction that this conjecture up there is true for n minus 1 points. So it's true when this point has gone to the boundary. But now, expand the boundary back again. And now use the fact that this conjecture says it's monotonic. So it's getting even bigger. So by starting with the point on the boundary and expanding, you see that conjecture 3 implies conjecture 2 and so implies conjecture 1. So we're getting stronger and stronger conjectures. This one is rather nice because it just refers to a monotonic property of this function in terms of this radius. and depends on having the notion of the hyperbolic version of the conjecture. But it's, it's, and again, this is confirmed by numerical calculations. So it's, everything is very nice. You keep generalizing the conjecture. You keep checking it numerically. Yep. The determinant gets bigger. Well, the conjecture says, Take n points inside a ball, make the ball bigger. The determinant gets bigger. That's what the conjecture says. Then why does that pr pr prove the other conjectures? Well, you start off with the, start off with with n points with one of them at infinity. You just shrink it down until you hit it. In that case, the determinant is simply the determinant of the n minus one points. So by induction over n, we can assume that, that determinant is bigger than or equal to one. Now we've got it. Now expand the ball, the point comes inside, you've got n points inside, and it's got bigger, and it keeps getting bigger, so it's still greater than 1. So the combination of the two things, the fact that when the point is on the boundary, you can forget about it, and that when you expand, the determinant is monotonic, even 3 implies 2. It's, it's a very simple argument, uh, surprisingly simple, but uh, uh, so the, this statement about monotonicity is, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's equivalent, stronger than all these, and it's a very natural one to make. So the determinant increases as a function of r. All you've got to prove is this function of r. Uh, if you could write it down, you could, you know, differentiate it and see the derivative is positive. Well, that's hard work, but in principle, that's all you need to do. Okay, now let's see, what are we next? Now, um, first observation is that instead of having a ball, we can equally, equally well take an ellipsoid. Why? Because by affine transformations, every ellipsoid can be made to look like a sphere. And all we need to preserve the data, the problem is straight lines. Affine transformations preserve straight lines. So you can always take any ellipsoid and make it look like a sphere. There's no loss, no gain. But suppose you've got two ellipsoids. And you see, before we thought of expanding the radius of the sphere, we had one sphere inside another sphere. Then there's only one parameter to play with, the radio, ratio of the radii. If you've got two ellipsoids, one ellipsoid inside another one, it's more complicated. Now you can reduce two ellipsoids to standard form, and so one of them can be made into a sphere of radius 1, say, by affine transformation. The other one can be simultaneously diagonalized, but you'll get your ellipsoid, A, B, and C. And if this one is inside that one, then these are all bigger than 1. And now the conjecture 4, you see, says that this uh, determinant is bigger for the bigger ellipsoids. If this ellipsoid gets that one, the points are all inside this one. Take a bigger one, S prime, so the determinant get, always gets bigger. That's the conjecture. Now, it's obviously generalization of the one when they're spheres, but it's better because it involves really three parameters. As a function of these three parameters, it's, it's increasing in all directions. So these are actually better, better uh, statements about the determinant. It, is, it expands as you expand the ellipsoids. And it doesn't depend on the how you write the axes and the, the making a sphere and so on. It's a very sort of geometrical explanation. Now we can keep going. See, I mean, generalizing is great stuff because you never stop. You get the fi final closed door here, you go up the stairs and get another door. Oh, where did I see? Did I? Yes, OK. So that actually is the end of the formal part of the talk. Uh, here are our, here are some references. Um, the, the, the first is one of the first, I wrote a number of papers this problem from one point of view or another one, and 
That's the first one. Then this is the one I wrote with Paul Sutcliffe. We, we had a lot of numerical calculations included, providing evidence for it. Uh, this is a paper I wrote with Roger Bilavsky, which, is, uh, uh, which I'm going to talk about when I gi give a colloquium in the math department shortly. Uh, and that talk will, in some sense, follow on from this talk. And this, this will be relevant for that talk. And that's where it's published. Now, um, since I've got a bit of time left, um, I'll ask myself a question which somebody in the audience could ask. So this is a nice period of geometry, uh, and if I solve it, I get a bottle of champagne. But why is this being given in the center of physics and geometry? Where's the, where's the physics? Can you see any physics in this? Well, the whole point was I, any claim with physics I deliberately censored. Um, in order to make it quite clear, this is a problem in elementary geometry. You don't need to know any physics uh, in order to formulate the problem or to solve it. But it does have links with physics. Though now I will let you in a bit onto the secret. Well, it has many links with physics. One of the difficulties is we don't, know, we don't know what link to use. But it has many links. Now, the first link was its origin. I mean, where did this problem come from? I didn't sort of you know, think of it one night when I couldn't sleep. It came from a physicist, Michael Berry, who asked me a question. And he said he came across this in connection with his attempt to give what is a sort of classical proof of the famous theorem in quantum theory, which is called the spin statistics theorem, which relates uh, spins, uh, spin one half and spin one, even half into spin, to things being fermionic and bosonic. Uh, and he, he, in the course of this, he came up with a problem. He said, can you, can you find for me, solve this problem? Well, now this problem was not quite this one. The problem he gave me was the following, very, very similar, you'll see the relationship. So take n points in three space. And I think for this purpose of being a physics, you should think of these as kind of classical states of n particles. There are points just sitting there. And now, can you assign to this set of states n vectors in complex n space, which are linearly independent? And the idea is you think you would think of this complex n space as the quantum space of the classical system. It's complex, therefore it involves complex numbers. And you want these to be independent basis vectors in the complex numbers that are basis of that little Hilbert space. Can you do that in such a way the following two conditions are satisfied? First, the map should preserve, be compatible with the ordering. You have n points, you have n vectors. If you permute these points in any way, you can permute the vectors. Secondly, it should be at least a continuous map. Okay, Continuous map, be equivalent with respect to the symmetric group. What you want to do is map the configuration space of n ordered points, n distinct ordered points in R3, space of dimension approximately 3n, into the space of, well, into n linear independent vectors in uh, Cn, which if you orthonormalize them and so on, gives you what's called the flag manifold. And the natural actions of the permutation group on both sides, both spaces have been extensively studied by topologists. And when he asked me this question, I said, well, surely this must be either elementarily well known or obviously false. How can a simple question like that be something that geometers haven't thought about? But the more I looked at it, the more I found it, it, it wasn't either obviously true or obviously false, and nobody knew anything about it. it. Hadn't occurred to anybody to ask the question. So that's what its origin was. And so I got interested in it. Things developed and it generalized and generalized. Now, I did actually manage to prove his theorem, what he wanted, by a very slight modification of what I've given you here. But if, if you can prove the conjecture I've given, that these end points, you form these end polynomials, if you can prove that independent, you've constructed explicitly n independent vectors in Cn by a beautiful, simple piece of geometry. And therefore, you've proved his conjecture. Not only proved it, but proved it in an even stronger form. I should say there's a stronger form, which he didn't ask for, but would follow from that construction, is not only should this be mapping between the configuration space and the flags be compatible with the symmetric group, it should also be compatible with the action of the rotation group, SU2. Um, you, rotate, you rotate the point in space. Um, this is for the Euclidean version. Uh, and you, or, or no, even the hyperbolic version. And then you make, the, make SU2 act on the flag manifold by its natural action on the polynomials. And the map I constructed, or con which would be constructed if they were connected was true, is obviously compatible with the, uh, with the group SU2. 
So uh, that conjecture would be proved in the best possible way if we could prove this conjecture. But I managed to prove what Michael Berry was asking by a slight cheat. Um, it's slight cheat in the following sense. You, see, you saw what I did here was if, if points got to the boundary, then they sort of you disappeared off site. Well, if you use that skillfully, you can make an induction which involves changing the curvature as you switch from n to n plus 1. And you, but you get a map which is, not, which is continuous but not smooth. But that's a minor detail. If you're a topologist, the interesting thing is there is such a map. Uh, and the homotopy class of that map is defined, but the map is not unique for a topologist. Uh, and any of these will do. But the conjecture here is that it is beautiful for such a map. In, and now, in the paper with Roger Belavsky, which I mentioned here, we prove this in a different way, um, which is not explicit. We don't construct a map. We get it by the solution of a certain differential equation. Uh, and it gives the answer, but it's not the elegant answer. And that method has some other advantages, which I will explain in my uh, other, other lecture. Um, now, there's another, connection, another possible connection with physics. Um, which is the following. We've got a conjecture about Euclidean space and about hyperbolic space. Now, where does hyperbolic space come from? Well, one way, if you're a physicist, hyperbolic space um, comes from the is a homogeneous space of the group SL2C, uh, which is the same as the Lorentz group. The Lorentz group, as you know, is a group that acts on Minkowski space, which preserves the quadratic form of signature 1-3. And so you, that physics, Monikovsky space, is about space-time in uh, a sense. And so the question is, is there a physical interpretation of this conjecture you know, which you can formulate in using Minkowski space? Well, the answer is you can not only formulate one, but you can generalize it. So now let's imagine we're, in, we're living in, well, not imagine we are. We live in Minkowski space, but to a first approximation. So we, we, we not only live at a fixed instant of time, but we have world lines. We, we travel through the, through the universe following our evolution. So imagine now you have n points which move. They give you n world lines, which might be straight or they might be curved, but they've got to keep moving forward in the light cone. And um, now let's imagine that these are stars, OK? They have n stars. And each star has an observer sitting on it. Might be a bit hot on the star, so best if you lived on a planet nearby like Earth, but very far away. That people at very, you know, the other end of the universe won't know the difference between the sun and the Earth. So think of it as n observers on n stars. Each observer looks out into the night sky. What does he see? He sees what's called the celestial sphere. And what does in a dark night? What does he see? He sees stars up there. So he, he, we've labeled the stars one to n. He's on star one. And he looks at star 2, and there it is a point on his sphere. There is star 3, there is star 4. He has n minus 1 stars in his celestial sphere. He forms his polynomial. Observer 2 over there looks up and sees similarly. These n different polynomials reside with the n different observers. At least in Minkowski space, you can imagine them all translated together, referring to the same set of variables. And you'll get your same polynomials. And you can make a conjecture that they're all independent. Or even if you normalize the determinants, they're all greater than or equal to 1. Now, that's a conjecture which is much harder to verify, because you know, you're talking about things moving in space. It's more complicated. You can, I verified it for 2. Not quite so trivial as it is for the. But if, if the relationship of that conjecture with the conjecture I gave before is that if you're in Euclidean space, and just think of the thing as being static, all the points just move don't move in time, they just go into vertical lines, then it's easy to see that the conjecture in Minkowski space gives you the Euclidean conjecture. If, on the other hand, all the points we have are stars emerge from a big bang, a big explosion, past and they all, all come out traveling uh, with different velocities but in different directions, then you'll get the hyperbolic space picture. And if you, in the limiting case when the point in the big bang goes to minus infinity, and they fit together. So the hyperbolic space is actually the Minkowski space, well, in a particular case of the Minkowski space uh, picture when they're all traveling in straight lines coming out of a big bang. Uh, but as to trying to justify, 
verify it more generally, I, I, I failed to convince myself one way or the other. I don't offer a bottle of champagne. I'd offer a bottle of champagne for a positive solution, <laughs> but not for a negative solution. Because um, I, one time I thought I had counted examples based on some simple geometry, but I subsequently realized that in my examples, things were not actually were traveling faster than light, and that's not allowed. So, it, you know, so then it begins to make sense in Minkowski space. And you know, then you begin to ask, well, what does this quantity mean? If this is a physical system, um, and you have a complex number associated to it, what is it? Where does it come from? And I have no idea. I, you, um, the absolute value might be some kind of energy function related to it, but there's also a complex phase which smells a bit more quantum mechanical. In fact, you believe in Penrose's idea that the complex numbers in quantum mechanics originate from the complex base of the light cone. That's exactly where this, these complex numbers come from. They come from the complex base of the light cone. Um, so uh, that's uh, so. One of the questions beyond my conjecture is: uh, Can anybody think of a good mathematical or physical meaning for this quantity? You give a definition, we make conjectures. You might even prove the conjecture. But does that tell us we understand it? Well, what does it mean? Does it, is it something we already know in disguise? Or is it some new object which we have to learn to live with? And I don't know. It's an entirely open question. Now, <clears throat> other ways in which it relates to physics, and this is partly what's involved in the paper with Roger Belavsky, is you can think of these points now, um, more or less as I did a moment before, as um, particles which interact in some way. Um, and Depending on the interact, they could be, for some people, they could be the points that describe a gravitational instanton in, in, a, in a gravitational model. Or they could be Dirac monopoles, some other situations. There are many situations where you can imagine these points describing a complicated physical system, which has fields and differential equations, interactions. And somewhere in that story, you may find a physical interpretation of the, of the conjecture. But again, I know I, I've tried and haven't succeeded. It's part of the challenge. So there'll be many bottles of champagne. I mean, if you solve the conjecture, you get one bottle of champagne. If you give me good physical interpretation, you get another bottle of champagne. Now, it's, it's, I'm sure the director here will have a good seller, and we can that we find more more but as we as 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 the problems roll in. Um, but it, 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 that was the digression to tell you that it has some connection with physics. But and that's why it's in this building. But the problem itself is a problem of pure elementary geometry. Uh, which, as I said, could have been, particularly in the real case, could have been described, uh, well, probably sometime in the 14th century. All you need to know was a little bit of uh, elementary geometry, the kind known to the Greeks, and the kind of algebra invented by the Arabs, and uh, that's all you need to know. So the real case could have been known a long time ago. A complex case would have had to wait to be, people knew about complex numbers, another century or two, but still, several hundred years ago. And what's surprising is that the problem never arose, and the solution. Now, if you think about it, the, the reason probably for that is precisely the fact that this is a problem about the relationship of the real numbers and the complex numbers in three-dimensional space. The real case is a subset of that. Uh, you might say, well, could you go on? Could you go on from, to, from the complex numbers to the quaternions? Could you imagine you, you have things with, using the fourth sphere as the quaternionic projective line. And the answer is, well, unfortunately, there aren't any decent polynomials over the quaternions because they're not commutative fields. So the whole story breaks down. So the, the dimension of three is the one case where this problem makes sense. It's the relationship between two-dimensional sphere and complex projective line. And it's, it's this place where real and complex uh, matters merge. And it's the frontier between mathematics and physics in many ways, fundamentally. And I say, Roger Penrose thinks that's where quantum mechanics begins. And I told you the problem of Michael Berry has a quantum mechanical flavor. You have n points, give me n states. Uh, and you may think of that as physics if you like, or you can think of it as mathematics if you prefer. Um, it, along those lines, I've speculated privately, and I'm not sure I should make it public, um, that you see, an inequality that kind uh, asks you, what other inequalities do you really know? 
And in the physical world, the most famous inequality is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So perhaps this problem, geometrically, is in some ways related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. There's a suggestion. Bottle of champagne for that one, too. Well, I think I'll stop now. Model. Yeah. What about using the Poincaré model? Well, I mean, if you talk, talk in terms of geodesics, it doesn't matter, of course. You're talking about two points, join them by unique geodesic, see where it gets infinity. Right. You can do that with the Poincaré model, and you get another picture, but it's mathematically the same. You just convert. The Klein model is better because it, you'll see. Different points in the sphere. No, yeah, and then they'll be equivalent under the conformal map that takes the sphere. So that, I mean, take two points in hyperbolic space. There's a unique geodesic joining them. Follow that to plus infinity and minus infinity. That's an intrinsic state of hyperbolic geometry. And the sphere at infinity is the sphere, is the infinite sphere. Doesn't matter which model you use, it's an intrinsic statement. The model, the Euclidean, the model I used is the better one if you want to think of its relation to the Euclidean space. You just see the same lines, you keep the lines, and don't even know what hyperbolic geometry is. You can formulate the conjecture in space. So, but it is the same, same conjecture. Um, and uh, it's intrinsic. and. Uh, when there are three points, you could ask the question, though, in the hyperbolic version of the question, is there a formula for this determinant in terms of the hyperbolic triangle that they determine? Yeah. A nice formula in terms of the... Well, that's what I had in mind, and I think Paul Circuit has worked a bit on that. Uh, I think what he's got as far as, as writing, working it out for the, for the equilateral case. I mean, uh, uh, what? Is there you have in false angles rather than... Yes, I mean, I'm, you, you, you can ask for a formula in terms of the angles, and but it, won't, it isn't as simple as, as this. It's some uh, hyperbolic counterpart. I'm sure experts in hyperbolic geometry would, could work out the formula. I haven't. But uh, Paul Sutcliffe has looked at it numerically, and he, he worked it out for the uh, equilateral case. By the way, I should say that uh, something else which I did, Paul Sutcliffe mentioned in another paper, this nice function you have n points. If you just take the absolute value, you get a real valued function. And this function is bounded above and below, conjecturally bounded below by 1. In the case of three points, bounded above by 9 eighths when, you, when, you, when the top points become equilateral. You can ask, what are the points which give the maximum in, in general, in the Euclidean case? And we, he did a lot of computer calculations, and you get beautiful pictures. You find these n points like to align themselves on a sphere. The radius of the sphere is not specified because it's a scale invariant problem. But if you start off with a conjecture about n points in space, and you're looking to extremize the function, and lo and behold, the points first decide they want to lie on a sphere. You didn't tell them to lie on a sphere. Once they're on the sphere, then they try to optimize something else. Uh, which is then very similar to what you get when you take problems which are on the sphere, write down some function, and try to minimize that, maximize that. Uh, but why the points want to lie on the sphere in the first place is a bit mysterious, yes. but that's the way the, and, we, and the difficulty with trying to prove things like that is that they don't actually lie exactly on a sphere. They lie very close to a sphere. Now, if you want to prove things lie on a sphere, that you might hope to prove that. To prove that things lie approximately on a sphere is much harder. I mean, you can do numerical calculations. Um, and when they do, do so they, in particular, for the numbers of points that correspond to the regular polygons, polyhedra, you get them. You get the regular, you get the Vs and all the others. But the number of points doesn't need to fit that. So you get other ones, which are slightly off. Uh, and they're beautiful pictures. And you get the whole, in that paper, you'll find a lot of pictures. So it's very, very, we rather like, although that was going the other direction, we rather liked looking at the nice symmetrical configuration you get by maximizing this function. But, uh, so is it, for example, a theorem that if you take a regular tetrahedron that that maximizes for the four points? Uh, I think the tetrahedron, yes, but and then 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 you we know them for for the well not the theorem is another word. These are things you can verify computationally. I don't think any looking for things that people might want to prove. Uh, well, if you can prove four, I th probably you, I I think it wouldn't be too hard to take take read and, and prove that it was a local maximum. You know, no. directly. But uh, um, for more points, they they and it's interesting. You get when you get. Um, Six points, you get sort of double. You know, you you get things which are no. Maybe we, I see you get a square with two points above and above, and sometimes they're the two points aren't quite on the sphere; they're just off the sphere, things like that. Um, 
and they're, but they're remarkably beautiful pictures, and uh, these turn up in a variety of problems, uh, which are physically different, but lead to the same kind of. Uh, mm. By the way, the polyhedra you get on the situational sphere are are, are dual to what are called. Um, oh, the ones that get with carbon. No, um, the uh, buckyballs. The uh, buckyballs. Yes, yes. Uh, they're they're, they're th things that they're, they, they they're ones that have you know. Uh, made out of pentagons and hexagons. And, uh, and those, for some reason, are the ones that turn up, with very few exceptions. 